Good morning. Wonderful to see you here today for our time of worship. We do have uh, several uh, announcements. The first one is that on the 30th, a couple weeks from today, uh, we're going to have our special prayer service that we have for our farmers and ranchers. It'll be during our regular morning worship service, but it'll be a special time of uh, prayer for our farmers and ranchers. So it'll be on the 30th of August, the last Sunday of the month. So you can be looking forward to that. Isn't that a beautiful field of corn there? Next, there we go. The return, the uh, uh, prayer rally that's going to be held in Washington, D.C. on the 26th of September. We're going to, we're going to simulcast it here, so uh, hopefully we'll have a good, uh, uh, you know, a good turnout of people who will come and participate in uh, this event. My sister Carol and her husband Keith, some of you remember them, they were here and visited us, they've visited us a couple times. Uh, they're going to be coming out to visit and they're coming a day early so they can come and, and uh, join with us in that. So I'm uh, really excited about that. All right, also today is our Mission Sunday. Hard to believe it, it's the third Sunday of the month already. Had an early start this month, didn't we? And uh, so we have the offering plate in the back for the uh, Scots and also for the Shaws. If you can uh, contribute to their mission endeavors, that would be greatly appreciated. Okay, well, let's uh, have Brother Kenny come and lead us in our opening scripture. Okay, if you join me in our, in our reading, um, I will lead and then you will follow. Okay. He will be like a, like a tree firmly planted by the streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and it, he prospers. Therefore, you will joyously draw water from the springs of salvation. They will not hunger or thirst, nor will the scorching heat or sun strike them down. <clears throat> For he who has compassion on them will lead them and will guide them to the springs of water. With weeping they will come, and by supplication I will lead them, and I will make them walk by the streams of waters. Jesus answered and said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But the water that I give him will, will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. The spirit and the bride say, come, and let the one who hears say, come, and let the one who is thirsty come, let the one who wishes to take the water of life without cost. May God bless the reading of his word. Now, if you'd all please stand, we will sing deeper, deeper.
was interesting. Okay. <laughs> well, give everyone a wave and just praise the Lord this morning. And stay standing for the affirmation of faith. Amen. All right, let's affirm our faith together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the one holy universal Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the dead, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Well, as we uh, go to the Lord in prayer today, we just want to give you an uh, update on Jamie. This last week he had a, a second surgery on the, the shunt that uh, he'd had the previous surgery on, and things went well. In fact, uh, the good news now is that they are uh, making plans for him to go to uh, the facility that's called Madonna, which is a rehabilitation facility, which is one step closer to being able to go home. So we can praise the Lord for that. Also, uh, Betty, uh, which is Sister Vera's uh, sister, we want to have special prayer for her today. She, she is really struggling with her battle for cancer, and uh, we just need to lift her up in prayer. Also, continue to pray for Pastor Ted and for Ethan, who is uh, uh, going to Afghanistan. I don't know whether he's already gone yet or not. I don't see the twins here this morning. But uh, we uh, are praying for him and kind of having him represent all of those who are going to, uh, in the military service, who are serving in those war-torn areas. I'd like to ask you also to remember my uh, pastor uh, friend, uh, Kenneth Ekby. Uh, I'm going to be sharing more with you about uh him uh, later on. I need to get the missions committee together and talk about uh, what we can do. We haven't officially adopted uh, him as a church, but uh, he's a pastor friend that I've become acquainted with over the last several months who lives in Nigeria, Calabar, Nigeria, down, it's the southwest uh, part of Nigeria, what's known as the rainforest. And uh, he is uh, uh, he posted a prayer request this week that the Islamic terrorists, of course, Nigeria is one of the countries that is harboring those evil people. Um, they have actually taken over a, an area in the northern part of Nigeria, and he said the rumors going around that they're in the southern part of Nigeria where the rainforest is, where he lives, and that they're just waiting for orders to begin their horrific deeds. Uh, they're already killing Christians in the northern part. Uh, there's been hundreds of them that have been killed this year. And uh, we just want to pray for, for Brother Kenneth and his precious family. He has a wife and uh, four, four little children, a beautiful family. So I'd like to ask you to pray for, for Pastor Kenneth. Also, Jan, continue to lift her up in prayer. She's doing okay. Uh, she's just holding her own. You know, she still has her ongoing uh, struggles that she deals with, but uh, it's going pretty good right now. So we're, we're certainly grateful for that. Okay, are there any other requests that you would like us to remember this morning as we go to prayer? Let's pray. 
Father, we just uh, thank you today for this uh, wonderful opportunity that we can come together, part of the body of Christ. And we know that we are here today because of Jesus and what he did for us upon the cross and what he does for us moment by moment in our life as your word tells us and as we affirm in our affirmation of faith that he's making intercession for us and we have your precious spirit abiding with us and here with us each one today as we're here for this worship service and father we praise you and thank you do we love you today and we worship and adore you we praise your name father we do bring our needs before you this is something in your word you've told us to do, to come before your throne and to, to present our needs before you. And so we bring them to you and we want to lift up Jamie to you and we want to praise you for the touch in his life, the progress that he's making. And we just pray that will continue, Father. And uh, we're, we're grateful for what is happening uh, and how it's developing and we just pray that it will continue to do so and just touch him and bring him to wholeness, we pray. Be with his precious wife, Angie, too, and just encourage and strengthen her. Father, we lift up today uh, Betty to you. We just pray, Father, that you will be with her in this uh, very critical time with her treatment. Lord, just be her help and strength and be her healer today, we pray. And we lift up Sister Vera, too, Lord, that you will encourage her as she has through many many years prayed for and encouraged others we just pray that you will encourage her and strengthen her during this time father we pray for pastor ted today that you will be with him and and uh, just fill his hours of the day with a very wonderful sense of your presence and give him a touch physically we pray we pray for continued prayer for jan lord that you will be with her and and uh, touch her body and give her strength and Father, we want to pray for uh, Pastor Kenneth and his family there in Nigeria and so many other Christians who are, who are facing such uh, dangerous situations in their daily lives. Father, we pray for your protection upon them. We pray for the, for the, uh, de the defeat of Satan and his evil influence that's in the hearts and lives of people that cause them to, to uh, want to destroy others because they don't believe the same. Father, we just pray that you will protect uh, Kenneth and his family and that you will bring uh, a harvest of souls through his ministry. He's on fire for Christ and he loves you and he's serving you. We just pray today, even today, uh, as their Sunday is coming to a close, that you will be with them in a very special way. And Father, we want to pray for Ethan today, going to Afghanistan, representing our country and the military as so many others we lift them all to you father we ask that you will be with them and be their protection we pray that you will uh, help them with the loneliness and and uh, uh, of being separated from their families be with their families back home and encourage them we pray father that they will know the wonderful love of Jesus in their life and the peace that he gives through all circumstances be with our country we pray for the revival uh, prayer that is going to be taking place in, on the 26th of September. Father, we just we ask that you will prepare hearts of, of people across this country and that we will see a, <clears throat> a real harvest of souls where we know, Father, that Satan doesn't want to see this and he's going to do everything he can to defeat and to keep the, the Holy Spirit from moving. But Jesus conquered him on the cross once and for all father and we claim victory in the name of jesus christ today for our country we pray for our president we thank you for his leadership father and all that he has done and how he has hung in there in the face of such evil influence that has tried to destroy him and uh, what he is doing and father we just pray that you will protect him and keep him and lift him up be with our uh the vice president uh mike pence lord and we thank you for his leadership and we pray for all those who are serving in the Congress of our United States, Father. Those, there are many of them that need you. They just flat need to have an outpouring of your 
of your spirit in their life of conviction to bring them back in line with the biblical principles upon which our country was founded. We need people of integrity, people who are honest, and people who are not hungry and uh, for power. And Father, we just pray that you will work in their hearts and lives. You can revive those people as much as anybody else. And we pray for a healing in our land from the very top down, Lord. We pray for our local community. We thank you for the leaderships uh, that we have here in, the, in our towns and in the county, Lord, of schools. We pray for our schools as they're trying to get back up and going again. And we just pray that you will be with them and, and that uh, um, people will, will do what they need to do and keep safe, but also realize that we need to move on with our lives and we need to, we need to educate our children and we need to see our community move forward. So guide and lead us, Father, in, in those areas. And now, Father, as we continue our time of worship together, we join our voices in saying the prayer that Jesus taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Pray with me this morning. Lord, we come to you this morning, unworthy of your presence. But Lord, you are the very air that we breathe. It's your presence, Lord, your Holy Spirit that dwells inside us, leading and guiding us into all truth. And we thank you for your gift, our daily bread, your very word. Lord, we are desperate for you, and we are lost without you. And it's your word that gives us life. It's your word that gives us breath, and we thank you, Jesus. Amen. So let's just sing together, This is the air that I breathe. This is the air I breathe. This is the air I breathe.
up his son for us <clears throat> he was whipped he was beaten he was spit upon he was forced to carry his cross he was nailed to that cross he had a crown of thorns put on his head he didn't deserve that but we did it even though he chose to go through it all through all that because of his great and unconditional love for us for in Matthew 20, 28, it says, The Son of Man did not come to be served, but, but to serve and to give his life for many. We need to give thanks to God, Jesus, the Holy One, because of what he has done for us. Let's think, sing, give thanks. Verses 4 through 10. It says, When the Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His, his disciples had gone into town to buy food. And the Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can, I, how can you ask me for a drink? For Jews did not drink or did not associate with Samaritans. 
And Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God, the gift of God, and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would, give, would have given you living water. Jesus was using the water at the well to start a conversation with the woman. And she had come to draw water for her daily needs. And Jesus was using it to address her spiritual needs. She discovered that the water he was referring to would lead to everlasting life. Let's all sing together. Fill my cup, Lord. By the Lord at the well I was seeking For needs and in that sense How is your peace today? The Apostle Paul in the book of Colossians in chapter 3 talks about the change that takes place in our life when we are following Christ Jesus. And as part of that he says, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. 
to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Here in western Nebraska, we grow a number of crops. We grow sugar beets, we grow beans, we grow corn, and uh, there's some wheat and some other crops around too. But almost all of it, with the exception of some dry land wheat and beans, all of it has to be irrigated. And it is done through a very sophisticated irrigation system that, that is just amazing, that has been developed uh, over many, many years. And the way it's done is in a couple, is two or three ways actually. One of the ways is uh, through siphoning the water out of a ditch by tubes. It's quite a process and uh, a little tricky to learn how to do to get the siphon going from the ditch into the, uh, into the field. And then the, there's gated pipes in which little gates are opened up uh, wherever, whatever section of the field that you want to irrigate and the water flows in. And then of course there's the center pivots which you, uh, you see in the background here. All of these ways of irrigating have to be implemented some way. They have to be turned on. In other words, the water has to be let into the field. And it's the same thing with our peace. Just like that water having to be let into the field, we have to let the peace of Christ rule in our life. We have to let that wonderful water of, of Jesus Christ, the water he said, if you will come to me and, uh, uh, and drink of me, you will never thirst again. We have to let that water into our life. We have to open up our hearts and we have to open up our mind to, to let that water flow. It says, let the peace of Christ. In other words, uh, I guess we can, uh, we can unlet it or not let it. We, we can, we can uh, refuse to allow it to flow in our life. But Paul says we need to let it flow. Open up the gate. Open up the gate of our hearts and let the peace of Christ flow in our life. He says, let it rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called in one body. How do we do that? How do we let the peace of Christ flow in our life? Well, we do so, he says at the end of this verse, and be thankful. One of the ways is to be thankful. We need to be thankful people. Christians, true born again Christians are thankful people. Thankful for what Jesus has done. Thankful for the blessings that God brings in our life. We need to, we need to let the peace flow by claiming the wonderful promises of God, by, be, by being into the word of God by being hungry for the Word of God. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, Jesus said, and they will be filled. So we have to be into the Word. We have to be focused on Jesus Christ. That's how you let the peace flow. So just think about this little, uh, little word picture today of the water being let into the field by the gate being opened up and the water being let into the field and let the peace of Christ flow in your life today. Let the peace of Christ flow in your life today. We had uh, a wonderful scripture that uh, we sang about and Ken shared from it, and that's what we want to spend some time in today. John chapter 4, verses 1 through 26, which is known as the uh, woman at the well event in Jesus' life. It says that now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that, that uh, Jesus was baptizing and making more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. So he was in Jerusalem, and uh, he was, uh, it was, this is kind of early in his ministry, and uh, he was beginning to proclaim the good news and, 
And uh, his disciples, it says that Jesus himself didn't do the baptizing, but his disciples did the baptizing. That was a <coughs> baptism <coughs> is a symbol uh, of a covenant that's being made. In other words, people would repent of their sins and they'd be baptized saying they want to live a new life. And so this was, of course, before Jesus went to the cross and uh, rose again. And so we have continued on that baptism idea and tradition as a symbol representing our new life in Christ Jesus. And they, it was a common practice in those days. So the word was getting around that this itinerant preacher, Jesus, and his disciples were baptizing more people than John the Baptist. And Jesus wasn't ready yet to really launch his ministry. So he decided that he would... Uh, go uh, back to his home province, the province of Galilee. And it said that he had to pass through Samaria. So he, uh, he came to a town. Let me just give us a little background here of, uh, of the layout. So Jesus was in Jerusalem. He'd been down there for the Passover. And all of this stuff was going on. And, and he decided that, well, he better, he better hand home. So that was up here. Nazareth, of course, is where he was uh, raised. He ended up going to Cana, Galilee. He spent a lot of time. In fact, most all of the ministry of Jesus was, was uh, taking place or took place in Galilee, most all of it. He would make trips down to Jerusalem, but for the most part, most all of Jesus' life was lived up there in Galilee. But uh, there is a province between Judea and Galilee. It's called Samaria. And uh, in order to get to Galilee, he would uh, said that he, he would had to go through Samaria. Well, normally that would not be the case. The Samaritans were uh, people that were hated by the Jews. Back in about, I think it was seven. 22 BC, before Christ, 722, the Assyrians invaded from the north and they took over that area of Samaria, which was the, the 10 tribes, the northern kingdom of, uh, of Israel at that time. They conquered that kingdom and they hauled people away, the Jewish people away, and then they would send Assyrian people down into Samaria. And they intermarried with the Jewish people that were there. And so they became Samaritans. The Jewish people down in Judea, Jerusalem and all that area, looked at them as being half-breeds. And they, they uh, hated them. There was a lot of animosity there. And uh, likewise, the, the uh, people of Samaritan didn't have a lot of respect for the Jews either. So when a, a Jewish person person typically would go <clears throat> from Judea to Galilee, he would take a route through Perea, uh, cross the Jordan River, and get up to Galilee that way, instead of going through Samaria. But Jesus had a divine appointment, and he decided to go right through Samaria, and he ended up in a place called Sychar. And there was Jacob's well. Jacob's well is, a, is still in existence today, and this is a picture of it, an actual picture of it. I want to read you a little bit about Jacob's well, a little history lesson here, which I think you'll find interesting. This is where Jesus met with the Samaritan woman. The woman had come to draw water at the well, and in the process discovered that Jesus was the Messiah. For Christians, Jacob well represents a place where a sinful person can come and encounter Jesus as Savior. As early as A.D. 30, the well has been the site of churches, <clears throat> a new one built after the previous was destroyed. The well now lies in the crypt of the Greek Orthodox Monastery of St. Jacob's Well in Nabalus in the West Bank. It's kind of a dangerous place to go visit, actually. It's in the West Bank. The well is significant for Christians, Jews, and Muslims. In 1979, 
the abbot of the monastery was murdered and the church defiled by Zionist Jews who wished to claim the area as a Jewish holy site. For Jews and Muslims, the importance of Jacob's well is due to its ancient connection to the patriarch Jacob, the son of Isaac, the grandson of Abraham. After an altercation with his brother Esau, Jacob spent 20 years with his relative Laban, and when he returned, Jacob came safely to the city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan, on his way from Padram, and he camped before the city. And from the sons of Hamor, Shechem's father, he bought, a, he bought for a hundred pieces of money the piece of land on which he pitched his tent. And there he erected an altar which he called Eloi Elo Israel. Although Genesis does not mention the well, tradition and the account of John's gospel lend credibility to the claim that this well was either dug or purchased by Jacob. In the New Testament, Jacob's well touches both physical and spiritual needs. The well provided fresh water for people to drink, which Jesus used as a metaphor for the spiritual living water he offered for those who accept him. The well is about uh, 150 feet deep, and you can see in the picture here that it's uh, set up so that you can actually get a drink from Jacob's well. So Jacob's well was there, and Jesus came to that location, and it says that he was wearied from his journey. Jesus got tired. He was God in the flesh. He was living in a human body, and he, he uh, experienced weariness. And so he sat down there by the well, and it was about the sixth hour, which is noon. The sixth hour is noon. And so a woman from Samaria came to, to draw water. And Jesus said to her, give me a drink. And it's in parenthesis, it says, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Here's an interesting point. Jesus fed 5,000 people on one occasion. Jesus fed 4,000 people on another occasion by the miracle of the multiplication of the loaves and the fish. But Jesus never performed a miracle to provide for his own food. In fact, when he was, when he was uh, in his temptation, one of the temptations that Satan threw at him was, command these stones to be turned into bread and eat because you're hungry. And Jesus refused to do it. He never provided a miracle to satisfy his own needs. It was always to to reach the needs of others. And so he asks for a drink from this lady. And this Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? Not only was she a Samaritan, was hated by the Jews, she was a woman. And it was unthinkable Thinkable for a Jewish man to speak to a woman out on the street or away from home. In fact, the rabbis, if they were out in the marketplace or something and their wife would come by, they would ignore her. They would not even speak to their wives outside of their home. It was just considered not good etiquette. But here was Jesus speaking to a woman and a Samaritan. And I want you to see a progression here. She refers to him as a Jew. She recognized that he was a Jew, because Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And here he is talking to her. And Jesus says, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and we, he would have given you living water. That kind of got her attention. And she said, sir? So she goes from calling him a Jew to showing a little more respect, sir. You have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, 
See, they traced their ancestry back to Jacob, just like the Jews did. He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. And Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give thee will never be thirsty again. The water that I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. <clears throat> and the woman said, Sir, again, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Jesus is dealing with this woman in a very gentle way. And he says to her, go call your husband and come here. And there was a long pause, I'm sure. And she says, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you're right in saying I have no husband, for you've had five husbands. And the one you now have is not even your husband. What you said is true. And then the woman says, Sir, I perceive you are a prophet. So he went up in her viewpoint another notch. You are a prophet. But I want, us to, I want you to notice something here, too. When Jesus is dealing with our sins, he doesn't, he, he doesn't dwell on our sins. He doesn't want us to dwell on our sins. He wants us to just come and, and recognize that we are a sinner. He brought her to that place where she recognized before him that she was a sinner. I've had five husbands. You've had five husbands. And she goes, oh. He didn't say to her, okay, well, now, you've had five husbands. That means there must be something going on in your life. So let's talk about George today, your first one. And then I'll come back next week, and, and we'll, take a look at, uh, we'll take a look at Bill. And then we'll, we'll just do this each week, take each one of those, and see if we can figure out what's causing your sin here. No, he came, she came to recognize that she was a sinner. She said out, she admitted it, and he and then she looked at him as one who was someone special. And she said, an issue that was well known to everybody, our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. See, what happened was, up there in, uh, in Samaria, when, when they became Samaritans, and the Jewish people rejected them, they set up their own mountain of worship, Mount Gerizim. In fact, they even created their own stories about Mount Gerizim. That's where the Garden of Eden was. It's where Noah's Ark rested. Uh, they had all of, those, all of those stories that were attributed to down below to Jerusalem area. Mount, in a place of worship, Mount Gerizim became their mountain. And she says, our fathers worshiped here and yours worshiped down there. And Jesus said, believe me, woman, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem you will worship the Father. I want you to see something. It's back up here. One place. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say that Jerusalem is a place where people ought to worship. Two times the word worship appears. As we go through this, you're going to see that the word worship or worship appears ten times in these four verses. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. It is. Jesus was Jewish. It came through the lineage of the Jewish people. But the hour is coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. And this is, this is my main point that I want us to get today to take home it's the Father is seeking. Who is the Father seeking? 
He is seeking people who worship. If we want to really connect with God, if we want to, if we want to have that living water that Jesus is talking about, we have to be worshipers of God. We have to turn our hearts and our lives, our attention to God and recognize who He is and who Jesus is. And when we do that, He will meet us. It, it, it doesn't matter where, you know, where we are or what we're doing or how we feel. Sometimes we feel like God is way off someplace and we feel so distant He doesn't feel like He's near at all. Worship Him. Begin to worship Him. Begin to praise Him. Begin to thank Him. Begin to worship Him. And think about all He's done for you and He will find you because it says the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. He's seeking you. But you have to open up the gate, as I talked about. You've got to open up the gate and let that water flow. He will come. He will, he will find you because He is seeking you. He says God is spirit. And those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. What is truth? Pilate asked Jesus. What did Jesus say truth is? He is truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is truth. You seek Jesus. You, you worship Jesus. You come into, come into relationship with Jesus, acknowledging all that he has done for you, and, and you, you, you praise him and you thank him for his goodness and his wonderful love for you, and recognize that, that his Holy Spirit will come and will abide in you because God is spirit and he wants to abide in those who worship him. And the worship said to him, the woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming. She, she was looking for the Messiah. He who is called Christ. And when he comes, he will tell us all things. And then Jesus said these glorious words, I who speak to you am he. This is actually one of the great I am references of Jesus in the original the word he isn't there. I who speak to you am. I am. There are those who say that Jesus didn't claim to be the Messiah. Well, you show them this. You show them this. Because he absolutely did claim to be the Messiah. Aren't those beautiful words? Just think about the Lord speaking to you and saying, I am. Here I am. I am He. I am, I am everything that you've been longing for. I am what you have been looking for in your life, what you've been hungering and thirsting for. Here I am. I am. Here I am. Come to me. Father, we thank you today, praise you today, that you are seeking, and as we open up the gate and allow the water to flow, you come and you fill us to overflowing. Father, I just pray that as we go from here today that we will just carry this thought with us to worship you. And when, when things get rough and we get tangled up with the daily activities of life and things get frustrating, to just stop and worship you. Because you're seeking worshipers, and when we do that, you will fill us, you will, you will sustain us, you will strengthen us, and give us what we need to live our life the way that you have planned and designed for us to live. Fill our cups, Lord. We lift them up, Lord. And we praise you today for the spring of living water. In Jesus' name, amen. I want us to sing this chorus in closing. Fill my cup, Lord. Just, uh, we sing it through a couple times, shall we? Just make it, it's a prayer, right? It's a prayer. Just make it your prayer today. Let's stand up together and sing it.
bless you. You may be seated and the deacons will dismiss you.